Shadow on the Land was an address given by a teacher to his students, colleagues, and future great-great-granddaughter almost 50 years ago. Shadow on the Land, a lecture. Part 2 In the last 100 years, which saw the vast revolution in technology, we witnessed the parallel destructive forces of that technology. We can show how short this period is by pointing out that it is just a little over one billion minutes ago that Christ walked upon the earth. And it will not be one million days since that, even until approximately the year 2040. Today, because we are unable to manipulate and control our environment efficiently, there is a dearth of food in one part of the world and an abundance of food in another. On the one hand, we see great difficulties in trying to manage the superfluous food, and on the other hand, the scarcity of food. Where there are superfluous foods, superfluous trees, superfluous animals, we can become magnanimous in our destruction and in an attempt to use the excesses for food or game or sport, we destroy and we only feel the depredation and panic when we see some form or another becoming scarce. From the early settlements of the several thousand years B.C., we can trace our present enormous cities with all their inherent problems. These problems are compounded and confounded by the explosion of the world's population. But prior to the crisis that we find ourselves in today, man turned to ingenious methods to increase his food supply, to take care of the world's growth and population. Certainly we are vandals and predators. We are at the same time victims of our own ingenuity. The discovery and use of fire made it possible for man to eat foods not before edible and to live in places previously not habitable. Discovery of agriculture methods has enabled man to obtain much more from a given area than could be obtained by primitive food gatherers, and the eventual discovery of irrigation and the use of fertilizers have increased the yields of acres many times. We are victims of these ingenious practices because only after the population has increased to alarming proportions have we realized that we have fallen upon dangerous and serious times. This is especially true in America, because we have invented and we use and apply science and engineering to agriculture and mineral extraction, and we intensified and speeded up the processes of destroying the original land. Concurrent with this increased efficiency of destruction, man has continued to increase in total numbers and in the size of his cities. We have not yet seemed to learn that food, space, and other needed resources set a number limit to the population of any living society. It is not necessary to quote too many statistics because the surge in population and many of its attended evils are too well known. It will be sufficient to say that in the 17th century there were probably 500 million people in the world. Today there are 3,000 million people. In every 24 hours, we are adding 180,000 more. Whatever the age of man, it is startling to note that the Earth's population reached 1 billion about the time of our civil war. The second billion appeared 80 years later. The third billion, seven years later. The world's population will be 4 billion by approximately 1970. A moment's calculation will be sufficient to bring home the dreadful condition time wrought in the world with so many people. Civilized people are shocked to realize that millions of Biafran natives of Nigeria will starve to death in 1968. If the world's population continues to increase at its present rate, it is estimated that between 12 and 15 million will die of starvation in the year 1975. The United Nations estimates man will number close to 8 billion at about the turn of the century. Obviously, there's a limit to our population increase, and it is scarcely probable that as we leave the 20th century and move into the 21st, that we will somehow be able to control our population. Hauser states that all the goods and services now available in the world would support about one-half billion people at our level of living. Yet the total population of the world is about three and a half billion. We are keeping people alive, even if we cannot feed them to make them comfortable. Last year there were about 125 million births and roughly 60 million deaths. This is a worldwide gain of 65 million people, 
or is it a gain? It is not enough, however, simply to control our numbers. It is essential that we hold, retain, keep in our natural state enough of the land to satisfy the aesthetic and artistic need of man as he faces his environment. So in approximately 36,000 days, we have come through several major wars and have brought to technological climaxes most of the tools and instruments and agricultural production that we accept routinely today. Many of us remember the beginning of the automobile, the airplane, the discovery of vitamins and antibiotics, and the rise and use of electronics. But with all of these new discoveries have come the attended evils and the attended problems that have plagued recent man, and have today reached a climax in a state of emergency in his use of natural resources. With all this progress, we return to the biological fact man cannot conquer nature. We have never learned what is the highest use of the land, but the time is now upon us when we can no longer have the luxury and the comfort of ignorance. Netting goes on to say, quote, Let us observe critically man's unnatural treatment of nature, his profligate wasting of his resources of his birthright, and let us determine to make our own home and neighborhood the most democratic, the most beautiful, and the holiest in the world. Unquote. As conservationist William Beebe said, quote, The beauty and genius of art may be reconceived, though its first material expression be destroyed. A vanished harmony may yet again inspire the composer, but when the last individual of a race of living things breathes no more, another heaven and another earth must pass before such a one can be again. In the days of Lindsay, conservationists were considered queer people. Today, thinking people are truly alarmed and concerned over our dwindling resources that have long appealed to men who feel the need for solitude and communion with the world. At the same time, we are told we now have a better life. Netting has said, quote, It is true we have a car in every garage, but we also have a junkyard at every entrance to every city. It is true we have more leisure to fish but we have fewer waters and dirtier waters in which to grow our fish. We may have many more miles of concrete road to speed us to vacation spots, only to find those spots are thicker with people than the neighborhood that we left. We breathe polluted air. We drink polluted water. We have the world's shiniest homes, but also the world's most poisoned streams. Unquote. The city of Memphis, Tennessee, a population of almost half a million, pours its entire domestic sewage supply untreated directly into the waters of the Mississippi River. Netting also has said that every valley that doesn't have its own dam is now considered an underprivileged valley, and every hill is a potential for the bulldozer. When agitation for recreation areas reaches a certain peak, the municipal and state authorities set aside areas of preserved lakes or forest lands or beaches. It then becomes necessary to build more golf courses, trailer camps, playing fields, and parking areas. Our freeways are designed to get us to scenic areas, and we must get there at 70 miles an hour. Two or three generations ago, our natural resources were regarded as bountifully endless. The forest was an enemy of man and should be cut down and destroyed. America is probably unique in history, when its early people swept westward through the great valleys east of the Mississippi and their wooded hills across the Great Plains to the mountains of the west, there is probably no migration in history that is quite so unusual or dramatic as man's conquering the west of America. The forest was the enemy to be destroyed so that agricultural land could be exploited. My father has recounted to me that as a boy he spent many months hewing with a broad axe native black walnut trees into railroad ties. Each tie brought to him ten cents. But America's woodlands, pasture lands, and rolling prairies were not endless, and so when the trees were finally all cut, as in the state of Wisconsin, the area had to turn to some other economy. We have now come full circle, incidentally, in that we realize the ravaging and the exploitation have reduced our natural resources until we can see the end where the government is now trying to buy back in order to hold for future generations some little areas almost now completely gone.
As the great migrations and civilization moved westward in America, the natural resources began to be destroyed at increasingly alarming rates. One of these began to unfold in the story of the total destruction of the passenger pigeon. A hundred years ago, in the days of John James Audubon, this beautiful bird graced the flyways of eastern America from the Canadian border to the Gulf of Mexico. It flew in such great numbers that Audubon estimated their population in the billions. It was probably the most abundant bird of all time. It was a sport to hunt the passenger pigeon, and it was a good market bird. Consequently, many people stationed themselves along the flyways to slaughter them in countless numbers. Ingenious techniques were developed other than just plain shooting to acquire as many as possible. In a field where the birds were in the habit of landing for rest and food, ditches four feet wide and two or three feet deep and a hundred feet long were dug, and grain was scattered at the bottom to entice the birds. In one end of the ditch a pit was dug in which a hunter stationed himself. He raised himself out of the pit and fired a shotgun into the flock. Hundreds of birds fell through one charge. On occasions, eight-gauge shotguns, so big it took two men to handle them, were used. Since the birds habitually nested in colonies, it was a practice for people to fell trees in such a way that hundreds and even thousands of nests containing squabs were knocked to the ground. It was a simple matter to go about under the trees, picking up sacks full of the young squabs to take to market. When the sacks were full, pigs were turned into the field to eat what birds remained. Huge clap nets were constructed in such a way that when a large flock of pigeons was feeding on the ground, the nets would quickly fall and cover the multitude. Of the entire bird population of the United States, the passenger pigeon had a natural craving for salt. Salt, or salted mast, was spread over the area where it attracted the birds. If a net was contrived over them feeding on the salt, as many as 2,500 could be trapped at one time. In the center of an open field, a post, about four feet tall, was dug into the ground. This was called a stool. A freshly killed bird with its wings wired with springs was tied in a realistic position on top of the post. Strings were attached to the wings and run through little eyes down to the post across the field to a hunter hidden in a blind. By pulling on the string, the dead pigeon's wings were moved, thus enticing as a decoy, living birds flying overhead. This is, incidentally, the origin of our expression stool pigeon. The ultimate horror was reached when live birds, with their eyes gouged out or their eyelids sewn shut, became decoys on a stool in a field. Obviously, even the great hordes of pigeons could not stand this slaughter pressure. There were people in the 1880s and 1890s who became alarmed and expressed great concern that extinction was on the way, but since there were no laws to prevent the wholesale slaughter, those people who wished to continue protested that all the hunters in the world, hunting every day of the year, could not possibly kill all the hordes of pigeons in America, but consideration for it was not to be. The last great pigeon colony was eradicated at Petoskey in the Straits of Mackinac in Michigan. Five freight car loads of pigeons left the region every day for 30 days. The hunters at night would set fire to an area around the nesting grounds. The pigeons frantically dashed into the fire and were roasted alive. The morning after the fire, the cooked birds were gathered in great numbers and taken to market. In the 1870s, several hundred thousand trappers and hunters were devoting full time to hunting pigeons. When the pigeons were abundant, they usually sold for a penny a bird in the markets. On many occasions, they sold for as little as three cents a dozen. Within a ten-year period between 1866 and 1876, ten million birds were shipped each nesting season. This number does not include those consumed locally. The birds began their decline in 1879. It isn't that the passenger pigeon could not have been saved, for it could have been bred in captivity. Since so few birds were kept alive, the race could not be saved. In 1893, Chief Potagon of the Potawatomi Indians found the last breeding colonies of only a few dozen pairs. The chief at that time said, It was proverbial with our fathers that if the great spirit in his wisdom could have created a more elegant bird in plumage, form, and movement, he never did. That quote is from American Heritage, 
volume 17, page 4, 1961. Soon the world would never again know the beauty and the grace of that gentle creature. The last passenger pigeon died in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914, marking a black page in our relationships to our environment. In 1930, the heath hen joined the multitudes of pigeons. This group became scarce through civilization and hunting pressures until authorities thought it was wise to capture and put the main population on Martha's Vineyard, an island off the Massachusetts coast. Careless picnickers set fire to the island, and the extinction of the heath hen resulted. The fire was catastrophic, but would not have been sufficient to cause this extinction had its numbers not been decimated to the danger point or had not the bulk of its population been unwisely concentrated. The Eskimo curlew, the ivory-billed woodpecker, have joined nine species of extinct mammals, about 30 other species of birds and six species of fishes, it is estimated, moreover, that in America today there are no more than a dozen black-footed ferrets, perhaps two dozen Everglade kites, about fifty whooping cranes, and no more than fifty California condors. During the last 150 years alone, more than 200 dramatic and colorful species and subspecies of mammals, birds, and fish have disappeared from the face of the earth, nearly fifty species in America alone. At least 100 more are endangered in this country, and on the international danger list, a shocking 1,000. Nor do we have to go far afield to see the endangering of some of our forms. In southwestern Washington, there is a white-tailed deer that inhabits the tidewater fields adjacent to the Columbia River. This formerly ranged from the California border through western Oregon and western Washington. Today, less than 400 remain alive, restricted to this narrow locality in southwestern Washington. Every year, its number diminishes as agricultural progress takes away its habitat. This is not a race that can live successfully in the logged-off lands as other types of deer do. Consequently, when man takes over its natural range for agricultural purposes, its reproductive capacities and its food sources are modified so that its population numbers dwindle. These facts are well known to national and state authorities, to educators, naturalists, conservationists, farmers, and politicians. Yet the situation is allowed to continue, and there are today no remedial programs in effect to save from extinction one more wild creature. As the great western plains were settled as the pioneers moved westward, the railroads began, as they said, to open up the west. This was buffalo country, and in the years between 1885 and 1900, the buffalo came perilously close to extinction. Conservative estimates put the buffalo population in the millions, where they roamed between the Rocky Mountains and as far east as the eastern borders of the Mississippi River. Hunters outfitted themselves and came west for the specific purpose of killing the buffalo for sport. There were many hunters who came to slaughter the animals for their hides, which sold for about 25 cents each. Most of the animals were killed not for their meat, but for the hides, or in many cases just for the tongue. Hundreds of thousands of buffalo were slaughtered, and had their tongues removed and their carcasses left to decay. It was not unusual for a single buffalo hunter to kill up to 2,000 animals per year. Even the government aided in the slaughter and gave its encouragement to the destruction of the animal. There were men hired by the army to supply the soldiers with meat, the soldiers, of course, were in the West to fight the Indians. General Phil Sheridan testified on one occasion at the Texas legislature and said, The hide hunter is doing more to settle the Indian question than the entire army has done in 30 years by destroying the commissary of the Indian. By the early 1870s, the southern buffalo herds were gone, and the killers moved into Nebraska, Wyoming, Montana, and North Dakota. The Northern Pacific Railway reached central Montana in the early 1880s. In 1882, more than 200,000 buffalo were killed. And thereafter, the decline in the buffalo population was sharp. One of the last big buffalo hunts took place in 1883 in North Dakota. Undoubtedly, the extinction of the buffalo would have been affected had it not been for one lone Indian, who became alarmed at the declining numbers. This Indian, named Michael Pablo, owned a small herd of about 40 head. He was persuaded to sell his herd to the government of Canada 
as federal officials in America showed no interest in keeping the animal from becoming extinct. The herd in Canada prospered and in 1912 numbered over 1,000. Today there are about 50,000 buffalo in existence and with provisional government, federal government, and private herds developing, the buffalo today does not face extinction. But for the concerns of one man, himself a ward of the government that tried to exterminate him and his race, the buffalo would have gone the way of the passenger pigeon. The western Indians used the buffalo for food and shelter. Of course, they killed great numbers, but not to the point of endangering the species. The buffalo was the most important animal for the plains and plateau Indians of the west. The Indians never shot or otherwise killed more animals than they could use. It was the important meat article of diet for them, and the hides were used for shelter and robes. In spite of the buffalo that the Indians killed off for their uses, the animal increased in great numbers. One old Nez Perce Indian, Tuktar Malwe Une, has told us that as a boy in the 1870s and 1880s, there were millions of buffalo in western Montana. Tuktar Malwe Une was born in 1861 and annually made a trek to the buffalo country over the old Lolo Pass Trail. In conversation with him in his 103rd year of life, he described vividly the buffalo herds and the uses the Indians made of this important animal. On September 30, 1877, five non-treaty bands of the proud Nez Perce Indian nation, fleeing from the United States Army forces to seek sanctuary in Canada, had paused briefly to rest at Bear Paw, Montana, 40 miles from their goal. In conversation with Sum Keen, who recently died at an advanced age, and Hemini Ilp Ilp, still alive at 96, we were told that the Nez Pierces knew that Colonel Nelson A. Miles' cavalry were close by because of the thundering thousands of buffalo that swept by their camp, stampeded by the soldiers. I am constantly struck by the fact that, generation-wise, many historical events related to conservation occurred not very long ago. There are people living today who knew the beauty of the original wild. Much interest and concern has been evidenced in recent years about the sea otter. This animal formerly ranged from the Columbia River to Point Grenville off the Washington coast. During the 1880s and 1890s, it was hunted relentlessly for its fur. A single sea otter pelt sometimes would be sold for as much as $700. Campaigns to kill great numbers of the animals for trade purposes were encouraged among the early settlers on the coast of the state of Washington. It was common practice for hunters to carve initials in their bullets so that when the animals washed in dead on the beach, they could be identified and claimed by the hunter. Platforms were built that extended above the rocks and surf so that hunters could be elevated and see further out into the kelp beds where the otters slept. About 60 huge tripods were erected on the sand or in the surf to make it possible for the hunting to be easier for the collection of the pelts. It is still possible to view the iron straps that bolted these platforms on Copalis rocks. In the middle 1890s and into the first part of this century, the animals became very scarce. The last collected was shot about 1910. A small herd lives today off the coast of Monterey in California. Otherwise, there are no sea otters left on the Pacific coast south of southeastern Alaska. The animals there are safe from extinction. In fact, they have, through good conservation measures, increased until it is possible now to have a small harvest annually. We'll conclude Shadow on the Land in Part 3. Good night, Nora.